seated. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we make the bold confession that you in your wisdom made the earth and all its creatures and continue to sustain it. For this and many other reasons, we praise you, O Lord, in Jesus' name. God's word that's before us this morning comes from the words of Psalm 104. And we hear those words read, and they're printed for you on page 5 of the bulletin. All of them wait hopefully for you to give them their food in its time. You give it to them, you get they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. You hide your face, they are terrified. You take away their breath. They breathe their last and return to their dust. You send your spirit, they are created. You renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord throughout my life. I will make music to my God as long as I last. May my meditation be pleasing to him. I will rejoice in the Lord. May sinners come to an end on the earth, and the wicked, may they be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, what is your worldview? You may think, what is a worldview, Pastor? Well, let me share with you a definition of what a, a worldview is from a book, uh, a book written by a Lutheran pastor called Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? He says this about a worldview. He says, the way people view or think about the world and themselves is what we call a worldview. A worldview is a person's perception of re reality. It is the lens through which they view his or her life. For example, we have heard it said before that some people view life through rose-colored glasses. This is an idiom that is used to show that some people will always view life from an optimistic perspective. Their lens, i.e. their worldview, causes them to see all of life's events, the good, the bad, and the ugly, from a positive perspective. Because of their rose-colored worldview, they do not see the glass as half empty, but they will always see it as half full. Everyone on this planet has a worldview. And really, there are two worldviews. One is a biblical worldview that has God in it, and the other is a worldview that doesn't have God in it at all. It's one or the other. The scary thing today is, is that there are many Christians who try to hold to a worldview that tries to take up the best of both. Our text for this morning is a beautiful psalm, and it's just part of Psalm 104 that talks about the creation. If you look at all of Psalm 104 in the Bible, it's really a song of praise that recounts creation. And how God created this world, going through all six days leading up to the seventh, the Sabbath, when he rested, stopped his creating work. It reminds us of what God did, that he created all things. That in six normal 24-hour periods of time, God spoke with his powerful word, and things came into existence out of nothing. Also, this psalm is a song of praise that recounts not only that wonderful creative act, but that God is not some God in a distance who made everything and then sits back and takes no interest in his creation, but that God's hand is still active in creation, taking, uh, uh, running everything, preserving it, caring for it, for the good of his church, for the good of his people. God is the creator, and he's in control. And that's why the, the, the psalmist says, 
may the glory of the Lord endure forever. What a wonderful blessing it is to know that our God not only has made everything, but that he cares for it and that he preserves it. Let me give you an example here. But this was something that happened to me probably about 25 years ago, early on in the ministry. I happened to be visiting one of my members who was shut in at home, went over to have a devotion with her and to give her Holy Communion, and her daughter was visiting from California. And her daughter was a, was a member of one of our churches out there. And as we're going to have a small talk and try to have some pleasant conversation, um, I had mentioned at that, at that time that, oh, you know, it was really dry. We were in the middle of a drought. and mentioned that, that uh, how many people were requesting prayers for rain. And this woman's daughter said to me, Pastor, why would you waste your time with that? I said, I don't quite understand. And she said, well, Pastor, with everything that we've learned today about science and weather and the weather patterns and how this happened, they, she goes, we've come to realize that God has nothing to do with that. So why would we even bother with it? And I said, where did you get that idea? I said, we might know why things happen. We might know and understand the weather patterns and everything, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that Scripture tells us that God is the one who makes the rains to fall, the grass and the crops to grow, and then cares for us through all of that. So God is still in control of that, even though we feeble human beings might think that we understand the whole process. That doesn't mean that God doesn't have anything to do with it. There are so many people today that like to think that there is a conflict between Scripture and and science. And really, brothers and sisters, there is not. Okay? There is a conflict, though, on what many try to put off on what science is. And Christians don't have a problem with science or the scientific method or whatever. But from a lot of people, when they look at science and the scientific method, they look at it apart from God. Okay? Where God is not a part of They'll talk about there's supposed to be with fossil evidence and all that millions and millions and billions of years. And they'll talk about carbon dating and make everything sound really scientific. But there's a problem with carbon dating because it's an attempt to try to explain things apart from God. They'll talk about the half-life of radioactive material and how it takes so many millions of years for it to decay, and that's how we figure out that these fossils are millions and millions of years old. But there's one problem with that. Okay? There's a guess that they make on how much material, radioactive material there was millions and millions of years ago. They don't know. It's a guess. And it's a guess that they made because they don't believe there was a God who created the universe. Some might ask, where did these fossils come from? Well, these fossils we found it can be made very, very quickly. Many fossils were made on Mount St. Helens 30 years ago and made in a short period of time. Christians look at the evidence and see God and see explanations that are given from God's eyewitness accounts. But yet, there are so many people that like to say, well, pastor, can it be both? No. We put ourselves in peril when we try to take God out of the picture, or we only have him partially there. God is the one who created the universe in six normal days. If, if it didn't go as God says in Scripture, you have to take it the whole nine yards. And what I mean is this. Scripture tells us that God created the world, created it in six normal days, and our text even tells us, too, about the perfection of that creation that God made. We're told after those six days that God looked at everything he created, and it was very good, it was perfect. Okay? But then sin entered into the world. Adam and Eve met the devil at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate from the forbidden fruit. They fell into sin. They were lost, and God had to make a promise of a Savior the offspring of the woman who would come and crush the devil's head. Now, can a Christian 
mix their worldviews on this. There are some who like to mix their worldview and say, oh well, you know what, maybe these six, these six days were long periods of time, millions and millions of years, and that evolution really happened. But if evolution happened in that matter, even if it was guided by God's hand, that means that there was no Adam and Eve. If there was no Adam and Eve, there was no fall into sin. If there was no fall into sin, there was no need for a Savior. God tells us everything was created at its best. Sin ruined it, and now it goes downhill. Evolution, which is in science, says that everything started out at its absolute worst, and it's constantly getting better. Common sense shows us as we watch this world to see that things are far from getting better and better. But they do follow God's word and show us that they get worse and worse as we approach the end. God indeed created everything. And it gives us a wonderful, wonderful reminder to be grateful for this wonderful creation that God has given us. But once again, as we look at creation and we look at at our worldview, the biblical worldview, what place does creation have? Once again, we like to mix things. I'll give you another example. A man that I served for many years as his pastor, I always looked forward to coming into church because he always had a joke. Always had some type of funny story. It was rarely the same one, except there was one he'd give you once in a while during the fishing season. And he'd usually be the first one in church, and he'd wait till there was a group around, and he'd say, Pastor, what do you think about this? What's worse? Is it worse to be out sitting in the boat thinking about church, or to be sitting here and thinking about fishing? You know, and I wanted to say, you know what, that's a toughie, but really it is not. As much as I like being out in the boat and experiencing nature and God's creation, it doesn't tell us about our Savior. It tells us that God is a kind, wonderful, loving God, powerful God who made this wonderful place for us, even though now it's tainted by sin. But it doesn't tell us who our Savior is. It doesn't tell us who Jesus is. It doesn't tell us how much he loves us and how much we need his forgiveness. It doesn't center us around the biblical, or the biblical means of grace. It doesn't Focus us on our Savior. Yes, it's a wonderful blessing, but it falls short. Scripture tells us, and as the psalm tells us too, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. But it doesn't tell us who Jesus is. That's what the psalm writer reminds us at, at the end when he says, May my meditation be pleasing to Him. I will rejoice in the Lord. May sinners come to an end on the earth, and the wicked, may they no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. The psalm writer reminds us what sin has done to this creation. It reminds me what the Apostle Paul talks about in the first part, first few chapters of his letter to the Romans, that even the creation, the entire universe, tainted by sin, waits for its deliverance at the end of time. When Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead, when the sheep, the believers, will be separated from the goats, the unbelievers, the believers taken to heaven, the unbelievers taken to hell, and then this entire creation will be destroyed. And God will make a new heaven and a new earth for all of his redeemed, everyone who trusted in Jesus as their Savior, Everyone covered with his holy, precious blood through faith will be there forever. And so we praise him for his deliverance. Not only that deliverance that will come at the end of time, but that deliverance that comes at the cross, where Jesus was all our perfection, lived a perfect life in our place, and took that punishment of hell that you and I deserve. We thank God for his deliverance, as we saw an example this morning with little Dylan, through the power of God's word together with simple water, where the seed of faith was placed in his heart to believe in his Savior, Jesus. Now he's a child of God, an heir of eternal life. 
That is what we look forward to. That is why we are here. We have so many things to enjoy here, but it's not the priority. It's not the be-all, end-all. We wait for our Lord to come and redeem us, to redeem this creation and take us to heaven with him. Such comforting words in all of Scripture that remind us that everyone who trusts in Jesus has that in our future, and it can't be taken away from us. I know you've heard me say this so much, but all of these things ring true in the Psalms. And I love what the Apostle Paul says. I think that he had to be thinking of the, of the Psalms, all of the Psalms, when he said these things. I'm convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is our worldview, the biblical worldview that has Christ at the center of everything we say, we think, and we do. And as we grow in our worship, as we grow in forgiveness, that's how God enables us to see how Christ is part of every aspect of our lives. May he lead us to acknowledge that, because without him we are nothing. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find those words on page 41 in the front of the hymn. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, of life everlasting. You may be seated for the collection of the offering. 